Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me for today's event. I'm Scott Story, Head of UK Operations at Opa Centre, and my role today is to facilitate our webinar, uh, The Climate Emergency, Reducing the Carbon Footprint of Bereavement Services, Part 1. There will be a Part 2 next month. Um, we've got around 45 minutes of information to share with you today, after which we'll have some additional time to take questions. As we go through today, please do add any questions that come to mind in the Q&A section, which you can access from the button towards the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also chat with us and your fellow attendees via the chat button or window. And I have some colleagues online with me today as well who will be monitoring that chat area. So if you have any issues, please let us know in the chat and we can try and assist. Finally, as is the case with all of our webinars, today's event is being recorded and we'll make that recording available to everyone who registered or attended within the next few days. So let's, let's move on. So let me introduce our panel for today. Uh, our panel includes Howard Picard, uh, Managing Director of Resumation Limited. Howard holds a, a BTEC degree in Manufacturing Engineering from Loughborough University and an MBA from Leeds University. He has over 30 years experience of engineering and became managing director of his fifth generation family business in 1995, taking over from his father, David. The LBBC group, originating as Leeds and Bradford Boiler Company Limited in 1876, comprises a group of engineering businesses, each focused on their specific market sector, but with a common foundation of pressure engineering, technical expertise and customer support. LBC Group products are supplied and supported globally. Resumation Limited, established in 2007, is a company dedicated to the global introduction of a sustainable alternative to burial and flame cremation. Resumation Limited became part of the LBBC group in 2016 as the key equipment for a system supplied within divisions of the LBBC group. I'm also joined by Steve Telford, <clears throat> Steve spent his first 20 years of work, <coughs> excuse me, working life as an energy and environmental consultant, covering all sectors of industry and commerce, both in the UK and internationally. Steve's carried out his first stack emissions test in 1976, and there were very few people in the UK or worldwide undertaking such work at that time, very unlike today. He's the author of a number of demonstration project reports carried out on behalf of the Energy Technology Support Unit of the then Department of Energy on subjects such as small scale landfill gas utilization from a shallow site using horizontal wells, mines gas utilization and waste heat recovery from hospital incinerators. On behalf of the World Bank, Steve was part of a team surveying factories in Turkey and Portugal in the glass and textiles manufacturing sectors to identify worthwhile energy saving investment opportunities that would be funded by the bank. His first visit to a crematorium came during 1982 when he was asked to investigate, measure and report on emissions to atmosphere from a cremator by Dowson and Mason, who at that time were a major UK producer of cremation furnaces. The company needed this information at that time in order to bid for overseas installation projects and there were very few, if any details available, on emissions at that time. Following the introduction of the Environmental Agents Environmental Protection Act in 1990, Steve acted as a consultant to many cremation authorities, both in the private and public sectors, and sat on the working party responsible for the production of PG5 stroke 2 95. In 1996, Steve joined the cremator manufacturer Tabo Inex. Uh, as a technical manager, which followed the later integration with the Tabo Inex and Evans Universal Companies, ultimately becoming facultative technologies, where he still works to this day, with his role covering sales in environmental matters. I'm also joined by Rob Maney. Rob is an executive board member of the Funeral Furnishing Manufacturers Association, the FFMA. Uh, Rob is an independent consultant with some 35 years experience in business, most recently, Rob spent seven years with co-op funeral care in their supply chain operation. Prior to that, Rob worked in the electronics industry, holding senior management positions with various companies in Europe, the USA and Asia. And finally, 
Last but not least, Brendan Day. Brendan is Secretary and Executive Officer of the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities. And Brendan will be joining the panel for the Q&A section later in the webinar. So, <clears throat> the journey so far. We started this series with the FBCA to highlight the impact bereavement services has on the environment and with over 75% of local authorities declaring a climate emergency as a sector, we needed to develop a proactive response. We highlighted that if nothing at all was done to reduce the sector carbon footprint, it's estimated it would be 1 million trees a year would need to be planted to offset emissions. Um, currently not specifically tested, every cremation generates NOx emissions. Collectively each year, cremations in the UK alone generate the equivalent NOx emissions of a car circumnavigating the world 43,000 times every year. NOx has direct and indirect effects on human health. It can cause breathing problems, headaches, chronically reduced lung function, eye irritation, loss of appetite and corroded teeth. Indirectly, it can affect humans by damaging the ecosystems that we rely on in water and on land, harming animals and plants. Our second in the series focused on the formation of the Environmental Stewardship Group and insights into the significant changes that are going to be required to achieve net zero by 2050. This highlighted the reality of what is needed, actions to reduce or offset our emissions by 10% per annum, which is a 65% reduction in our carbon emissions and our carbon footprint by 2030. <clears throat> but it's not just about using a cleaner fuel or what's the most eco-friendly process. It's about education and societal change. Uh, John Cross shared with us this information last time, but moving forward, 59% of the predicted reduction in our carbon footprint needs not only technological enhancement, but societal and behavioral changes. <clears throat> John also shared with us um, the path that we are predicted to follow. The journey to net zero has four key phrases. Uh, one, demand reduction and efficiency. Two, take up of low carbon solutions. Three, expans expansion of low carbon energy. And finally, offsetting emissions. But the truth is, regardless of method, human disposal will always have an environmental impact. Today, we all have a part to play to review the services that each of us provide and what can be done to minimize the environmental impact of our services. And our panel today will provide insights from three very different aspects. I must stress there is no singular answer. Moving forward, environmental considerations will form part of everyone's decision-making criteria personally and professionally. So having set the scene, our first panelist is Steve Telford, who's going to provide some insights as to how facultative see the impact of the environmental agenda. Over to you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to give this presentation today. It's quite a complicated subject and there's a lot to say. And I do apologize in advance for the speed in which I'll have to whiz through this. You will, of course, be able to access all the slides later and we will make available a more comprehensive version of this, including all the information I have to leave out on the FT website. Next slide, please. The cremation sector was to all intents and purposes unregulated in terms of environmental performance before the introduction of the EPA in 1990. That in turn gave us PG-5-2. Pollutant emissions at that time were sometimes awful, horrific, horrendous. I know that because I measured them. After process guidance note PG-5-2 was introduced, this immediately made the entire stock of cremators in the UK redundant and a programme to replace them began. The newly introduced secondary combustion chamber requirement of 850 degrees C with a two second residence time was the main reason for the replacement of the old cremators as they couldn't be converted or modified. The new replacement environmentally friendly cremators increased gas consumption by typically four or five times from the old levels to new. But it was a price that had to be paid for cleaning the wire act and it was very, very successful. 
PG52 was revised in 2004, and this introduced abatement plant for the first time to, to reduce mercury emissions as well as other pollutants. This note gave some relaxation to the temperature requirements that revised down from 850 degrees C to 800 degrees C in the secondary chamber for abated cremators only. And this resulted in gas savings of around 30 to 40% compared to unabated cremators. Next slide, please. So how can I reduce my energy use? If, if we look at cremation plant utilisation worldwide, it's quickly obvious that the way we choose to run cremators in the UK has a major negative effect on fuel consumption. Generally speaking, UK cremators are underutilised when compared to some of our neighbours. The most efficient way of operating cremators is to run the smallest number for the longest possible time. This could mean that you may have to have more than one shift to operate the uh, cremators, but this is already common practice elsewhere and they will run much more efficiently in terms of energy use. To start off in the UK, we have to establish energy use per cremation figures for all crematorium sites to find out where we are now in terms of energy use. I'd expect there to be wide variations in the energy consumption figures from site to site. Now, I've looked at a great detail the energy use at the German crematorium that we operate within our group. I selected a week randomly during March this year to look at energy consumption and operational data. We have a big advantage here in that we have full access to all of the information needed to, to, to do the exercise because it's our site. For the initial assessment of this, I've used an often quoted figure of 32 cubic meters of gas use per cremation, as this could be used as a baseline figure for comparison purposes. Next slide, please. So this was the breakdown of the gas use for, the, for this random week uh, at the German crematorium. Um, and we can see there, blue was a 34% for preheat, with almost all of this used on a Monday morning to heat up the cremator after it cooled over the weekend. Orange and grey is, is what we're calling waiting and overrun gas, that is partially wasted fuel that could be reduced by tighter operational control. The, the avoidable extra gas use may be due to preheating the cremator too early in the day relative to the time of the first cremation, or not ending the cremation as soon as it's finished, leaving the cremator idling at full temperature, but not necessary. Yellow, 38%, this represent, represents the gas used during the cremation itself, from the time of charging to the point where the cremator needs to be raked. So for this particular week in March, the total gas consumed was 336 cubic meters, 42 cremations took place. This gives an average gas consumption figure of eight cubic meters per cremation. And this is pretty much in line with what we'd expect, but it's a lot less than the 32 cubic meters from where we started. Just to confirm that this is an, an abated FT3 cremator of ours built in the UK, runs the German environmental standards, which are 850 degrees C and a one and a half second residence time in the central combustion chamber. The emissions in, emission limits in Germany are broadly similar to the ones in the UK. Next slide, please. The gas use across the working week, you can clearly see that Monday's gas use is the highest due to the fuel used to preheat the preheat cremator after it cooled down. The small and no weighted bar represents some of the gas use resulting from inefficient operations being stripped out to give you a feel for what could be reasonably expected. During this week, the cremator was carrying out between eight to 10 cremations per day. Looking at, looking at the trend, the gas use falls progressively day to day, as you would expect. But you'll notice that the gas use on Friday increased. And looking at the logged information, this was mainly due to the operator firing the burner in the main chamber to reduce cremation cycle times. This normally happens in cases where there are small amounts of tissue remaining on the hearth when at, when at the point the cremation is pretty much complete. These residual remains on the hearth will prevent the operator from raking down, as in the UK. Firing the main burner in these circumstances is optional, but you could just wait and settle for a longer cremation time, and this would result in gas savings. This tends to be how electrically operated cremators operate, because they have to, as they don't have the option of a main burner to speed things up. Next slide, please. So how could we reduce gas use? Now, these, these numbers from Germany aren't the best that could be achieved by any means, and these figures don't reflect the most energy efficient in manner in which the gas-fired cremator can be operated. But this is just how it was during that week. 
the energy consumption could be reduced in a number of ways. You could run the cremator seven days a week to eliminate the Monday morning gas preheat. You could reduce the standing heat losses from the cremator by fitting flu sealing dampers or super insulating the cremator casings. You could lower the secondary chamber minimum temperature down to 750 degrees C, something the same as an electric cremator. You could prevent the main burner from being fired to shorten the cremation times. And you could install the latest energy saving controls and software upgrades available. Now, these measures would reduce gas use significantly. Next slide, please. So how does the gas vary during the week? Each bar on the chart represents the gas consumption for each of the 42 cremations carried out that week. About half the cycles during the week didn't use any gas at all during the cremation, so they don't appear on the chart. I think the gas consumption pattern really shows how much individual cremations vary in character. And these variations are not due to changes in the way the cremator operates or is operating, but are detected by the nature of the charge that can be so unpredictable. Just to repeat that this information is from a working crematorium that hasn't been fully optimized by any means and just shows how it performed, warts and all. Next slide, please. So, how much can you save? Well, this really depends where you are right now on this initial efficiency curve that I've, I've prepared. The curve is based on 32, cumator, 32 cubic meters per cremation, discussed earlier, being classified as four, and the real life figure of eight cubic meters per cremation for the German crematorium we have discussed earlier, and that's being classed as good for now. These days are refined and updated using natural measured energy consumption data for each individual crematorium in the UK. We can extend the curve into excellent territory using information gained from the same German crematorium we've looked at earlier. There, they had a very, very busy January 2021 due to COVID cases. And during that month, 448 cremations were carried out on the same number two cremator alone at an average gas consumption of 4.5 cubic meters per cremation. Now this really reflects the effect of seven days per week operation within 16 to 18 hours per day. And this represents excellent operational efficiency. These numbers have really been achieved and are not pie in the sky or predicted. That's the way it was. Next slide, please. The costs and environmental benefits. Now, I still have no idea or data for electric cremator energy performance. And I'm not aware of anything that's been published elsewhere on this subject, which I, which I find surprising, but we do need this information to share in. So on that basis, we have no data. Now the table is produced on the basis of a reduction in fuel use down from the 32 cubic meters of cremation suggested earlier, down to a true measured performance of eight cubic meters of gas measured at the German crematorium, whose data we've analyzed. This equates to a 75% reduction in CO2 emissions by adopting operational efficiency measures alone, or in other words, running fewer cremators for longer. Looking at the capital investment required, full replacement of existing gas cremators with electrically heated alternatives will be expensive. And this would maybe be a better state as being from £300 million for the UK as a whole. If you already have top quality cremators installed, capable of working for extended periods, and you really don't have to spend anything at all to achieve a very significant reduction in CO2 emissions. You could also invest in additional energy saving measures by having these retrofitted to your existing cremators or invest in costs associated with fuel substitution to reduce your emissions of CO2 even further and even approach zero without significant expenditure. You, you should always take into account the fact that electric cremators will probably have longer cremation cycle times than the gas fired equivalents when you formulate future plans for staffing plans and operating periods. You do have the opposite, operate, oh, option to limit main burner operations towards the end of a cycle when firing gas to save even more fuel. But this will inevitably at the expense of longer cremation times. But this is a zero cost modification. Next slide, please. Green energy, I just thought I'd do a, a few words on this because um, th these are actually real life CO2 emissions that you should consider when considering alternative energy sources. This chart shows the latest published government data that you should use to calculate company greenhouse gas emissions. This assumes you purchase energy, energy from the national grids, in other words, gas or electricity from the mains. Any renewable energy produced on site is excluded from this. 
and green energy from renewables have already been taken into account in the government figure for electricity. So these apply irrespective of tariff. You'll see that despite the increasing contribution from renewables for power generation, electricity is not a particularly green option due to the fact that the majority of power is still generated using fossil fuels and in particular natural gas. You can also see that biodiesel and biomethane are almost carbon neutral. There must be a danger that the widespread adoption of electrically heated cremators in the short term would actually increase and not decrease greenhouse gas emissions and further research is required. For this reason, the current and future projected UK energy mix should be carefully considered when moving forwards and nothing should be definitively ruled in or ruled out. Next slide, please. Energy cost Im implications. Uh, again, when planning, planning and budgeting for the future, you should consider the relative costs of the various energy sources available for use. Electricity is a premium energy source and has a price to match. Bio-LPG can be at 100% carbon offset like a green electricity tariff, and its cost per unit is about half that of electricity, for example, and it's worthy of consideration. This chart uses the latest published government data. Next slide, please. What other factors should we consider? It seems that electrically heated cremators will run at a minimum secondary chamber temperature of 750 degrees C for technical rather than environmental reasons. And the gas fire cremator could do exactly the same in order to reduce energy use and perhaps save an extra 20% uh, on, on your gas bill. One potential problem we have looking forward is that running at a lower temperature in the secondary chamber could impact on any future decisions regarding the abatement of NOx. As these lower temperatures may not be compatible with efficient NOx reduction using the technology currently employed, in fact, probably all technology. A previous paper implied that selective catalytic reduction could be used in place of selective non-catalytic reduction, which is the technology applied now. But selective catalytic reduction would seem to us to be an unrealistic proposition and is certainly not compatible with low energy use. We may, in the future, have to make the choice between minimum energy use or NOx abatement. So a question for you all, which is the most important local air quality standards or global CO2 emissions? You may not be able to have both. Further research needs to be undertaken before you decide. Next slide, please. So the next steps, you should establish your own energy use programmation to find out where you are in the overall scheme of things and how you compare to others. Introduce an energy monitoring and target setting scheme. Look at, look at moving away from cremating on a single shift Monday to Friday to more extended working hours to improve efficiency and reduce emissions. You should investigate the various sources of energy available to fuel your cremators and always make your decision based on facts and not assumptions or poorly, poorly researched information. Next slide, please. DEFRA must rule on cremator operation at 750 degrees C when the abatement plant is out of service for any reason to prevent the most dangerous substances being released to atmosphere. This has never been an issue until now. This person who troubles me greatly is that the elimination of the emissions of highly toxic substances from the chimney must be priority number one. And is one of the reasons we quadruple gas use due to PG52 in the first place. We must decide if NOx abatement is feasible or sufficiently effective at temperatures of less than 800 degrees C by conducting further research. The industry needs to decide if electrically heated cremators are what it desires using the proven information in order that the, the cremator manufacturers can respond accordingly and embark on a costly and long-term program of replacing perfectly serviceable and potentially efficient cremation equipment with something else. The, the choice is yours. We should always bear in mind, of course, that any large capital investment program to reduce, to, to replace cremation plant is, it will in itself generate a huge amount of CO2, which, which, which could completely wipe out any advantages that you had by doing something else. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, Steve. Um, like I said, there, there is no one single answer. So uh, 
Our next panelist is Howard Picard uh, from Resonation. Howard, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to Scott and OPA Centre uh, for putting on this uh, good series of webinars. And thank you to the FBCA and Brendan uh, for inviting us onto this. Uh, we're very pleased to be part of this series. Um, and uh, today, uh, sorry, next slide, please, Scott. <clears throat> today, I'll just, uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes, uh, briefly run through uh, the, the basics of the process, for those who may not be aware, why we see it as an important part of, of this series and, and uh, the issues we're dealing with today, um, where we are in the rest of the world uh, with dealing with resumation and uh, how everybody can uh, help in this, uh, in the wider climate emergency, but uh, our role in this, and then uh, how we see it going forward. Um, and I will stress that we, we very much see resumation as an option. Uh, there are uh, many options out there, and what we'd like to present is resumation as one of those options. Uh, next slide. So just to give a little bit of background uh, to ourselves, uh, to add to what Scott said in the introduction. Um, as an, you can see, a, a fairly uh, established business uh, back in the late 1800s. And we've moved with the times as a business uh, using our core technology to move through. And we work a lot in an aerospace industry, working a lot with Rolls-Royce and uh, GE. We work actually in the implant business. So uh, Dupuis, Zimmer, Biomet, they're all customers of ours for helping with the manufacture of their products. And uh, what we, uh, our business, what we're about is engaging with customers, engage with the, the industries to try to constantly use our technology and development of technology to improve the solutions uh, for them. And nowadays that invariably is around emissions and climate change and efficiency of the equipment. And a, and a most recent example with the pandemic, we have service guys who travel the world all the time. And uh, because of the pandemic, but also because of the climate, we're now increasing the remote uh, support for all our equipment throughout the world. So that reduces travel and uh, the association of climate on that. Next slide. So, um, resumation, uh, it's also known a number of other names, water cremation, alkaline hydrolysis, fundamental aquamation, uh, many uh, descriptions for this process being new. Um, in essence, uh, as it says here, a gentle natural end of life alternative to flame cremation and burial uh, with environmental benefits. And that's what we'll talk a little bit more about. But uh, many of you will know Douglas Davis from uh, Durham University. Uh, he put it very well uh, a couple of years ago um, as to how he sees uh, this process uh, fitting in. So just as British inventive engineering helped save the land for the living in the 20th century UK through flame cremation, so in the 21st century, this innovative water-based process of accommodating human bodies offers new opportunities for an age framed by ecological concerns of land use and air quality. Next slide. So very uh, high level simply, the process takes what happens at the creation of life, uh, which is a biological sort of chemical process where the building blocks are uh, used to uh, create life uh, and uh, the human tissue that we're all part of. It obviously takes about nine months to, uh, to get to that point, but um, that's what happens in the creation of life. And next slide, what you see is what in essence happens at the end of life, which is the reversal of that process. And with burial, the, the body decomposes and that takes 
uh, a number of uh, weeks or months uh, or years even uh, to do that with the resumation process basically we we're mimicking the same natural process but by increasing temperature to around 150 degrees c adding a very small five percent amount of alkaline we reverse that process and the body is returned to its uh, original building blocks in that way it takes about four hours start to finish uh, with the actual uh, hydrolysis process taking about an hour hour and a half uh, within that and what you're left with at the end are the bones the next slide please so uh, these are, are obviously dried because it's a wet process and then they're processed in the same way uh, that uh, the bones from cremation uh, flame cremation are currently done and what you end up with is this white ash. Uh, there's no carbon residue in that, obviously. And uh, they can be returned to the family in an urn uh, in the same way with um, the current cremation. The body, uh, prior to the resumation process, is placed in a uh, shroud. And it's through that that the body is placed in the resumator. So, uh, behind the scenes, it's a little different, but with regards to what the family would see, uh, by and large, it would be the same as current cremation techniques. Okay, next slide. So, fundamentally, uh, the process, because there's no uh, burning going on here, has no emissions to the atmosphere directly from the process. Now, we know that no process like electric cars and all these things, no process is completely emission free. Somewhere in the chain there is. And that's why a technique called life cycle analysis is often used nowadays to try to capture what actually the full end to end um, impact on the environment is. And this is what the Dutch government commissioned uh, over the years and they did this uh, an organization called TNO did this report and with regards to the measure for climate change the results were quite dramatic uh, for resumation. Now as always these standards evolve, the uh, measures, the ability of electricity, how to generate electricity changes, so it's requiring to be constantly updated which we're currently doing for the UK and again uh, taking either burial or cremation there are different methods. And as Steve has been saying, there's an awful lot that can be done to improve the efficiency of cremators as well. So uh, again, this is why the data is important. It's absolutely important, the science and the data behind it, but we have to understand the context of each one to be able to properly compare. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. So what we've been trying to do, uh, particularly pre-pandemic, is just help the sector uh, understand what the process is about, what the equipment required is, so that when they're planning the future and the future investments, then people can understand what's involved and what they, if they wish to adopt uh, water cremation. But equally, uh, the regulators, those people who are responsible for the the, the methods that are used uh, for this very important activity are done correctly. So we've had uh, many open days here in our, our facility in Leeds, um, and we had very good attendance of that. Unfortunately, the pandemic put paid to that. We are hoping that if we follow the roadmap we're currently on, that we will start uh, having these again. But in the meantime, uh, and even during that, if anybody wishes to know more, then please contact us and we will be very pleased to either do that online. Uh, we uh, can take limited visits at the moment and we're five minutes from Leeds uh, train station. Well, 15 minutes, sorry, by train to another train station, which is five minutes away. Uh, so very easy to, to get to by train. One thing is certain, once people 
come and they see what it's all about, then the understanding improves dramatically. And by and large, they go away positive that somewhere in the range of disposition options, uh, water cremation has a place. Next slide. Now, we all know that with this application, the sector, it's not something that lots of people want to uh, engage with outside the sector. So it's difficult. It's very difficult, very challenging to overcome these hurdles. And as many of you will know, uh, we've had issues with the uh, um, output from the process, which uh, requires to go into the water treatment system. And uh, without the data, we had the usual, oh, I don't want anything to do with that, which many of you know was the reaction from Seven Trent many years ago. Now, that's understandable. So what we have to do is get the data, the science behind it to understand. And with, again, the support of the FBCA, we did that. In April 19, we resumated five uh, deceased at a temporary installation in Sheffield University. Uh, the whole report, the whole analysis was done independently by Middlesex University. And in February 2020, just before the pandemic, uh, we were um, issued with a consent from Yorkshire Water. This has now led to approvals in Scotland, approvals in Northumbria, and we have other approvals underway at the moment. And the, the feeling now within the water industry is we've seen the science, we understand the data, we're okay with it uh, now. Next slide, please. So what's going on elsewhere in the world? Well, it's been available in the US for a number of years and uh, where it is available, uh, many families have chosen it. So it's a system that's happening, it's working. It's, as I said there, thousands of families have been uh, uh, selected it, uh, resumation. What's interesting is that uh, certainly Bradshaws that we see here, they felt that this was a very environmental process, as, as we know in the data, and they made the whole facility very green with the ground source heating and all this. But actually, in, the, in reality, a lot of families have chosen it because they see it as more gentle uh, than as well as the environmental side. Now, uh, in the US, it needs to be made legal. So many states are going through that process. There are over 20 states now that have, have made the process officially legal. Um, the most recent one we're expecting any, any day is uh, Hawaii, which again um, has interesting associations because of the water and uh, the Hawaiian community uh, see this as attractive in this way. Uh, we have uh, lots of interest from elsewhere around the world. South America has an awful lot of interest. New Zealand, Australia uh, are also uh, very keen on the process. Next slide, please. Close to home, uh, we have, uh, many of you'll know that uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch Health Council have recommended to the government that this is passed. So there has been tremendous interest uh, from the Netherlands uh, since the end of last year. We have a system under manufacture uh, for there in anticipation of the legislation being passed. Uh, we have a system uh, on order for Ireland as well um, and tremendous interest in Spain and France. In fact, for Spain, the um, uh, Funexpo uh, exhibition in Madrid, which is expected to happen beginning of June. They've asked us to send over a resumation system to have in their funeral home of the future uh, demonstration facility there. So there's tremendous interest happening all over uh, the world. And what we would like to see is that with the UK, we're able to uh, also uh, have that engagement. Thank you, Scott. Next slide. So uh, this one, uh, there are, um, it, it's all about understanding. It's, a, it's an industry, it's a, it's a process where we un totally uh, get that it has to be done correctly and the 
ethics behind it and the, the uh, data behind it has to be done. But more and more um, awareness is coming out there. Um, in Holland, quite an amusing publication there showing uh, how beautiful and clean uh, can it be, the process. Uh, many of you might have seen uh, the paper by Georgina Robinson at Durham University, uh, Dying to Go Green, which is a very informative paper on how resumation can be seen in the UK. So uh, lots of engagement. What's interesting over the, certainly this year is that the um, public are increasingly contacting us and weekly we have uh, emails. In fact, on Sunday, I had, we had an email from a, a couple who live here locally in Pudsey in Leeds, uh, where they've heard about it and they said, where could this be available? And research, a recent one here, Ipsos Mori poll, um, consistently shows that if offered the choice, uh, approximately 30% of people without really understanding what it's about would elect for it. Next slide. So again, just widening the context, it's where are we with this? And it's, it's, it's all around this climate change and uh, environmental uh, situation. And uh, Douglas, again, who I referred to earlier, gave a talk at the CBC where he was referring to the, the elements. He says air, you, you can't see, so he, can, he didn't put that one on. Uh, but the earth, fire and water, and it's a natural progression. And in time, the, the society has been through the Reformation, the Industrial Revolution, and now it's very much the ecological revolution and the importance of science versus the politics. And, and that's where it's important to have the data and how he sees the 21st century as the ecological age where uh, the current cremation will continue and improve. And, and as, as Steve it's very clearly uh, presented just now, the different options that can be taken, but then new options as well. Next slide, please. So just to finish, um, we hope that people recognize that there is a place for resumation in the future of disposition. The uh, environmental stewardship group uh, and the activities that are happening there are fantastic. They really are looking into the options. Uh, Julie Dunk put it very well in her uh, presentation uh, last webinar, where she says how this heralds a new area, era of cooperation. And that's how we would uh, uh, support and like to engage in that way. So um, you might just see there from the uh, presentation of the Richard McDonald, the, the Deputy Chair of the Environment Agency, there is a recognition on a wide basis that uh, change needs to happen. The environment, it's not going to get better unless we make changes. And we see, and we hope you see, that um, resumation, water cremation will be part of that solution. So thank you all very much for listening. <coughs> Thanks, Howard. Um, a, again, a, a different take and an interesting alternative in terms of what is current, the current methods. Our final panellist for today is, is Rob Maney from, from the FFMA to talk about how the Fuel Furniture Manufacturers Association is responding to these challenges. Rob. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the Furnishing Manufacturers Association, thank you for inviting us to contribute to the on this crucial uh, vital project. I'm Rob Haney and I'm an executive committee member of FMA. We are a members organization of over 70 member companies in virtually all aspects of the industry. We were founded in 1939, a particularly notable in history. We assure you it wasn't us. Our Chief Executive, Alan Tucker, has been very active in representing our members on the DMAG and the All-Parliamentary Group on Funerals and Bereavement, and very importantly, in liaising along with other members of our industry, with the Cabinet Office, and our ability 
readiness and planning in response to the COVID pandemic. Alan has also been instrumental in advancing the FFMA's Coffin Certification Programme. It's the most comprehensive in the UK and with a test protocol being carried out by one of the world's leading product testing companies. Uh, next slide, please, Scott. I'd like now to cover a few brief examples of how the manufacturers of the bereavement services industry have responded in recent years to ever-growing environmental concerns. The FFMA's Coffin Casket and Shroud Certification <laughs> Protocol, while centred around fitness for purpose, health and safety, is a vital contribution to the development of standards in an as yet largely unregulated industry, with over 170 products going through the process and bearing the FFMA stamp of approval. It's expected that this number will have increased beyond 180 products by the end of this year. Many companies within our sector have factories and manufacturing facilities which utilize, for example, biomass heating, rainwater collection, solar energy, water utilization optimization, waste management, recycling, and reusable packaging. Almost exclusively, water-based lacquers and paints are used in the manufacturing process. All chipboard mills in the UK are FSC certified, and a great number, perhaps the majority of coffin manufacturers utilizing this material, continue to adhere to FSC standards in their own part of the supply chain. The mills themselves are using increased amounts of recycled material in the manufacturing process. Some of the larger funeral director organizations have driven environmental recognition into their supply chains, such as the use of the SEDEX environmental and ethical software tracking tools, which aids in supply chain mapping, and in turn the adoption of SMITA standard audits where appropriate. Additionally, we have seen the use of fair trade products in our industry, although perhaps perhaps not as widely as in others. Next slide, please, Scott. None of this, of course, comes without challenges to our industry. Our industry as a whole is small. To give an illustration of this, I mentioned chipboard earlier, a much talked about material, and we'll speak about it some more. But purely in terms of scale, the mill in Hexham in Northumberland, operated by the Edgar Corporation, could supply the entire annual requirements of the UK funerals industry and around one and a half shifts of production. Manufacturing and product supply and bereavement services also is virtually exclusive with companies operating solely within this sector. For example, the companies who supply gowns and coffin interiors do not also make shirts for Marks and Spencer. The companies involved in coffin manufacture do not also make kitchen units. Almost exclusively in the first tier of the supply chain, companies are SMEs, a very high percentage of those being family owned. Now, all of this severely limits the intrinsic ability of our sector and the companies who operate within it to affect economic driven change. The economic factors are vitally important if we consider, for example, just for a moment, monumental masonry. If in this theoretical example, we assume that all monumental granite originated in India, monumental masonry would represent 0.4% of the UK's annual granite imports from India. If we consider fair trade, then we must accept that that involves international freight. If we regard that as unacceptable, then we need to work out how we deal with the moral implications of the elimination of the fair trade premium, which is used to better the lives of people working in those industries in the developing world. And very importantly, if we try to look at the constituent elements of bereavement services and try to gauge the impact of those elements in terms of contribution to greenhouse gases, then we perhaps see the the greatest element is being the vehicles, 
Now, while ceremonial vehicles and the challenges relating to them have been covered in previous webinars, it's worth noting that this is dwarfed by the contribution from the private vehicles of attendees. Just to give another example, when we consider the entire process from collection of the body through care and preparation of the deceased, the energy requirements of various facilities from construction through operation, conducting the ceremony and disposal through cremation, the impact of the coffin, for example, would appear from some data to be less than 10%. So what of alternate products and services? In terms of practical challenges and returning to uh, monumental masonry to give an example because it's been spoken about in previous webinars, it is true that granite quarrying continues to exist in the UK. However, they've been virtually quarried out for building and opening new seams to get at memorial grade product has proven too costly. Additionally, there would not be enough product to supply the demand of the UK industry and in fact justify the investment of the new skill sets required. If we seek to eliminate embalming due to the presence of formaldehyde, how do we deal with the reality of funeral capacity in major population areas where the time between death and the funeral can be in excess of 20 to 25 days? How do we deal with the undercapacity in refrigeration? How do we gauge the impact of increasing that capacity against the embalming process? How do we deal with the very real and practical considerations when a body is removed from refrigeration if it has not been previously embalmed? It often seems obvious to us that product A must be greener than product B. The FFMA is aware of a number of environmental impact studies. And some results of two of those have been shared with us by member companies. One study was conducted without the presence of a body, the other with. One study showed non-traditional product performing better in terms of emissions. The other showed traditional chipboard product performing better. Speakers in previous webinars have spoken of how traditional our industry remains. And while choice is thankfully increasing, this remains an industry where every client is rightly categorized as being vulnerable. So driving change from whatever direction has to be carefully considered. Can we, for example, practically consider some kind of product tax in an environment where funeral poverty is regarded as a very real and unacceptable condition in our society? Next slide, please, Scott. I've spoken about what's already been done and the challenges of doing more, both as a sector as a whole and from the standpoint of the individual companies who operate within it. However, real as those challenges are, we firmly believe that the scale of the challenges cannot be allowed to paralyze us into inactivity. We believe that future direction of travel must be data driven. If it is felt, for example, that an independently commissioned study based on an entire LCA of the constituent elemental impacts of bereavement services is something which would benefit our industry, the FFMA would be very willing to discuss and engage with other interested bodies to see how that could be advanced. We all of us clearly want to do the right thing. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the panel has been very, very busy answering questions during the discussion. So, at this point in time, I have no open questions. Are there any any comments or uh, statements from the panel that you'd like to include at this time? Brendan? Um. Scott, yes. Well, a couple of the questions are somewhat challenging for me, and I think we will need them to be answered by the particular panellists. Uh, so I'm sure if we can discuss that after the event, we can get uh, some written answers and go out to, uh, to everybody. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, at the end of this uh, 
webinar, there is a, a survey. So I'm, I'm actually now going to ask the audience, which basically asks you to give us some feedback in terms of how you found this, this series of, of webinars. And also to ask you if there are any other topics or any other areas that you would like us to expand, expand upon. Um, oh, and I've just had one question come in, which from Katie Davis saying, do you envisage the UK FDs taking on resumation equipment to carry out their own body, body disposal? I guess that's for you, Howard. Um, I, I don't know how that will end up uh, because it will be determined by the sector, the funeral sector itself, not by us. Um, but uh, like with many areas of change, it, it might be, it might not be. But from the process point of view, uh, there is no reason why a, a funeral director, as funeral directors in some cases own crematoria, uh, there is no reason why funeral directors can't take on in some part of their business, some area of the business, the aspect of disposition. That's how I would see it from an equipment manufacturer. Perfect, thank you, Howard. Uh, and one other question I have here briefly, and then we will need to wrap up because we're tight on time, is do the FFMA promote the use of a low formaldehyde-based products? And if not, why not? I guess that's uh, we don't, yeah, we don't actively promote the use of anything, being as we are a members organization and we're not um, promoting or forcing anything right now. Uh, we're certainly open to looking at our role in doing that kind of thing in the future. Um, we do know that many of our member organisations um, use low formaldehyde products in the embalming process, uh, depending on the circumstances relating to the requirements of that embalming score. Um, we also know that during the recent pandemic, um, much of that went by the bayside and moved back to um, higher um, impact formaldehyde products because of the requirements of um, um, the COVID situation. So the answer is no, we don't at the moment. We don't actively promote the use of any specific product right now, um, but our role in doing this certainly could change in the future, and we're more than happy to look at it and play a part, talk to our members, companies who are members, and I'm sure they'll have an insight into that. Perfect. Thank you, Rob. Um, <clears throat> very, very, very quickly, um, there, there's another question that's been posed. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get a response in in the time that we've got left. Um, but the question is, how do we propose to reach the decision makers in the councils to take these issues seriously? They have far too many cremators and tend to work for less hours, and yet they're citing the emergency. I'm going to answer that question or get the panel to answer that question offline, purely on the basis of the time constraints that we have. Um, but thank you for the question. So to just conclude, um, once again, Thank you all again for, for joining us for today. I hope you have found it informative um, and you'll join us for the next one where we talk to uh, other alternative suppliers or other suppliers for the bereavement services sector um, on the 12th of May. So once again, thank you all for your time um, and, your, and your input.